In the psalm we've heard, the mood is also awe and wonder. The psalmist is intoxicated by a vision of God's creative and providential work. At times, the vision is on a grand scale, stretching the heavens like a tent, setting the earth on its foundations. At other times, the vision is particular and tender, watering the cedars of Lebanon so that the storks may make their nests in their branches, providing high mountains as a home for goats and rock badgers. Humans are part of this scheme, enjoying wine, oil, and bread as God's gifts, three of my favorite foods, but they are only part. In commentary on this passage, Karl Barth found it embarrassing that humans are only discussed alongside other creatures, but I find it a profound perspective in which the psalmist is able to picture themselves along a whole universe of God's other creatures. All creatures look to God for food, and the psalmist rejoices to God that when you open your hand, they're filled with good things. The psalmist also recognizes the fundamental commonality between all God's creatures. When you send forth your spirit, they are created. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. How does the psalmist respond to this celebration of God's work? With exuberant praise, I will sing to Yahweh as long as I live. I will sing praise to God while I have being. The conclusion to the psalm is a call to bless and praise Yahweh. And as you're all well aware, the call to praise uh, the God who is creator and sustainer of all things is by no means unique to Psalm 104. Other psalms call the whole creation to praise God in response to God's grace. Elsewhere in the wisdom literature, in the closing chapters of Job, in Proverbs, and in Ecclesiastes, we find similar themes. The creation narratives in Genesis 1 and 2 share much of this vision. The prophets lament the plight of humans and other animals subjected to God's judgment and look forward to the time of the Messiah when all creatures will dwell peaceably on God's holy mountain. In the New Testament, Jesus teaches that not a single sparrow is forgotten by God and that birds and lilies are good models for Christian discipleship. And in the reading we heard from Paul's letter to the Romans, Paul laments the groaning of all creatures subjected to the labor pains of the new creation and looks forward to the time when all creatures will be released into the freedom of the children of God. And in the opening of the letters to the Ephesians and the Colossians, uh, they express a a faith in Jesus Christ that is nothing short of cosmic, making peace between and gathering up all things in heaven and earth. Psalm 104 is therefore a particular instance of a vision of God's gracious dealings with creatures that is a key theme of biblical texts. And how do we respond? Well, in the first place, we'll want to rejoice with the psalmist in God's astonishing, creative, and wondrous work, the magnificent beauty and diversity of creaturely life in which we are but one small part, the intricacy of the particular mode of life of every creature, the abundant grace of God in provision for all creatures, the vision that all this life, compromised in its flourishing in these days, will be gathered up in the fullness of time in a new creation in which every creature will attain fullness of life. Amen to that. But there must be a second note to our response to the psalm this morning, one that recognizes that the ways in which we treat other creatures are at fundamental odds with this theological vision of the psalm. I recently came across a statistic that summed this up more starkly than anything I had seen before. Over time, we have taken more and more of God's world under our control, including the lives of other creatures. By 1900, the biomass of all domesticated animals exceeded the biomass of all wild land mammals by three and a half times. That means by then, we had already taken habitat from wild animals on a tremendous scale, depriving them of an environment and replacing them with domesticated animals given life only to provide us with food. But in the last hundred years, we have gone much further. 
We increased the number of domesticated animals by four times between 1900 and 2000, which was a major factor in reducing the population of wild land animals by half, and meant that by 2000, the biomass of domesticated animals exceeded that of wild land mammals by 24 times, 24 times. It's no better in the sea. During the same period, we reduced the population of fish in the oceans by 90%. The big picture is that we have not been content to live as one among many of God's creatures, as pictured in Psalm 104. Instead, we have attempted to take a godlike power over their lives, monopolizing the earth to provide for our greedy wants, subjecting our fellow creatures to the horrible cruelties of industrialized animal agriculture and aquaculture, which have also resulted in a mass extinction of wild animal species. Reading Psalm 104 in the knowledge that this is how we have responded to the magnificent diversity of God's creaturely life is deeply uncomfortable. How can we praise God for providing a place for the storks to build their nests when we have since destroyed it? How can we praise God for opening her hand to provide food for every creature when we have so frequently acted in ways that take their food away? We worship a God who creates and provides. In response, we have destroyed and deprived. It seems to me that we are in danger of reading this psalm in bad faith and in so doing, failing to recognize that our actions place us among the wicked that the psalmist condemns. Now, thank God, we worship a God whose nature is always to have mercy, and who, through Jesus Christ, offers us today and every day the chance to confess our sins, turn from sinful ways, repent, receive forgiveness, and begin again in newness of life. Thanks be to God. We worship the God who in Jesus Christ proclaimed Israel's prophecy was coming true, good news for the poor, liberation for the captives, recovery of sight for the blind, freedom for the oppressed. It's no stretch to recognize God's other than human creatures as among the poor, the captives, and the oppressed in our days, especially as the jubilee year Jesus proclaims is a culmination of a seven-year pattern of Sabbath for the land which allowed no sowing or reaping which Leviticus 25 states is to benefit domesticated and wild animals alongside male and female slaves, hired and bound laborers. If our repentance for the ways we have contributed to the mass destruction of the lives of other creatures is to be sincere, we must seek to find glad patterns of life in response to God's grace that reduce our devastating impacts on our fellow creatures and embody Jesus' liberating call to Sabbath and Jubilee.